for the weekly rushes. A rushed rush through all your movie and streaming news for this week. Sorry we're a little bit late. It was Father's Day this weekend, which meant we watched films and we did things together and it was fatherly and it was filmically and therefore we couldn't do the weekly rushes in time. Well, the first news story is uh, director, Oscar-winning director, Paul Haggis. Uh, you'll know Paul Haggis. He directed Crash, which has the strange notoriety of being described as the worst film ever to win the Best Picture Oscar, if you know what I mean. So yeah, he directed Crash. I think he, I th or produ he directed and produced Crash. I think he produced Million Dollar Baby, which he also won an Oscar for. Um, and I think he wrote wrote the script for Quantum of Solace, the Bond film. Uh, he's also quite famously, or used to be, uh, a member of the Scientology Church. I think he appeared in a, a very famous documentary all about the uh, the hidden practices and the uh, sort of, you know, the untowardnesses of uh, Scientology. He was a kind of key contributor in a documentary some years ago. Well, Paul Haggis has been arrested in Italy on suspicion of sexually assaulting a woman who was, by all accounts, discovered at the airport uh, or, or was taken to a local hospital where, because she'd been discovered at the airport uh, wandering around in a confused state the police said. The BBC uh, has contacted Haggis's uh, representatives and uh, the uh, Canadian filmmaker said this in response, make inquiries as soon as possible. I am totally innocent. Prosecutors suggest that the, the alleged victim who was discovered in this confused state at the airport alleges that um, the suspect, Paul Haggis, uh, forced the young woman whom he met some time ago to undergo sexual intercourse. Uh, the woman was forced to seek medical care, they then added. Is there smoke without fire? Is, is there a smoking gun? I don't know. So anyway, he's very keen to sort of get this kind of cleared up kind of rapidly. Uh, it does sound slightly chaotic and slightly jangly, but it's quite a big news story. Oscar winner, uh, Oscar winning director essentially arrested in southern Italy uh, for allegedly sexually assaulting a woman discovered uh, in a state of disarray. One of the big movie releases this week, which is one of the films of the week, is Lightyear, which is the prequel movie to uh, Toy Story. And so this is truly an origin story. But of course, we've talked about Lightyear. It's hit the, it's, we've talked about it in Weekly Rushes. It's hit the headlines because uh, it's the first uh, animated or certainly first Disney Pixar animation uh, to feature a same sex kiss in the film. Um, which led to all sorts of kind of a backlash uh, due to the Floridan, the Floridan um, law don't say gay legislation where, you know, there's a sort of push in Florida to not promote uh, he uh, homosexual relationships or any alternative forms of uh, sexual relationships as in any way normal. And so for a moment, Disney cut the same sex kiss out of Lightyear and then reinserted it because uh, obviously lots of people who work for Pixar and Disney got very cross with Disney for doing this. But Disney Pixar's Lightyear is obviously, it's not going to be played, it's not going to be screened in countries such as Saudi Arabia, uh, the United Arab Emirates and other parts of the Middle East, Malaysia or Indonesia. And of course, this will be because of the LGBTQ content in the film. Uh, the, the, the issue pivots around a character called Alicia, who's voiced by Uzo Aduba and another woman. It's two women who essentially embrace within the film. And so, and so that's the kind of bone of contention, if you like, is the fact that obviously within these countries where they have uh, regressive and, and, and uh, sort of medieval and archaic laws and attitudes to things such as homosexuality, Obviously, a Pixar movie turning up with a same-sex embrace or kiss is, is not going to go down well. Chris Evans, who voices, you know, he of Captain America, uh, who voices uh, Buzz Lightyear, uh, describes these people as idiots. To quote Chris Evans, he says, the real truth is those people are idiots, people who are anti the same-sex embrace. There's always going to be people who are afraid and unaware and trying to hold on to what was before. But those people die off like dinosaurs. I think the goal is to pay them no mind, march forward and embrace the growth that makes us human. And in the same week that Lightyear is struggling to get past Jurassic World Dominion in the box office, uh, it's uh, probably moot that he uses the analogy of dinosaurs. Um, other films that have been blocked in these uh, countries, these Middle Eastern, principally Middle Eastern and sort of uh, Gulf countries, uh, Muslim countries, include West Side Story, where the remake obviously featured a new character who was a, um, a gender fluid character uh, within the cast, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, and obviously The Eternals, in which Brian Tyree Henry plays also one of the first gay uh, superhero characters that we've ever had. So, um, you know, so there's, there's history here. And so these films uh, do generally get chopped and, and, and cut from the kind of running order in these countries. I'm sure it will always also likely, like, yeah, meet all sorts of restrictions and resistance in China. Maddie and Kiki are going to be excited about this one. Um, Sony Pictures have tapped up the director Justin Lin. Justin Lin has exited from the 10th iteration of the Fast and the Furious franchise, Fast X. Uh, apparently there are creative differences. <laughs> 
I don't want to be a bit of a snob, but how can you have creative differences about a sort of film like Fast and the Furious? It's like either the cars go fast or they go slow. Is that the kind of creative difference that they had, do you think? Anyway, Justin Lin, who was obviously making that, he's set to direct a film uh, inspired by a very successful manga series that I know the girls are into, and I've seen a couple of animated, I think there's an animated series out there of this, called One Punch Man. The titles are so self-explanatory, aren't they? Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, he's gonna direct One Punch Man for Sony Pictures. Um, it, he's teaming up with the same team that brought us Jumanji, The Next Level, and, and Venom. So it's that side of Sony, Jumanji, I thought were the, they're brilliant, brilliant movies. Um, uh, One Punch Man, incredibly popular in Japan. Uh, just to give you a sense of what the story, the story follows a character called Saitama, a superhero who can defeat any opponent with a single punch. It's kind of self-explanatory in the title, but seeks to find a worthy opponent after growing bored by a lack of challenge. Uh, in his fight against evil. So he's got such a spectacularly successful one-punch hit, he's got a bit bored, so he needs to get bigger challenges, bigger villains, and bigger enemies to punch. Um, so yeah, so this I think this will be intriguing, this will be interesting, and I think it's coming from a very rich part of the Sony sort of framework. Sticking with Sony, Sony are going to try and rinse a little bit more out of Spider-Man No Way Home, as if you're making, what is it, 1.7 billion or whatever. It's one of the highest grossing films of all time. 1.9 billion it's made at the global box office. There you go. Well, Spider-Man No Way Home, they've decided, because it's 60 years of Spider-Man as a comic book later this year, and 20 years since the original Spider-Man movie. Two brilliant kind of uh, anniversaries there, aren't they? Um, uh, Sony are going to re-release a new version of Spider-Man No Way Home, and they're calling it the one with all the more fun stuff put back in. It's called the more fun stuff version. So rather than the director's cut or the producer's cut, they don't really get that, or the writer's cut, they don't really get that, or the extended edition, this is gonna be Spider-Man No Way Home, the more fun stuff version. Uh, so they don't specify what the new version will add. The rumor mill has it that there's about 15 minutes of cut scenes and fun bits. I have to say, well, as soon as the, spoiler alert, as soon as the three Spideys all kind of intersect and come together, I think it's a really, really rich opportunity to, to give us more of that. We just want more of that, more of that. Um, so this is looking likely to return on second, the 2nd of September or around the Labor Day weekend in the US. So look out for that. There's gonna be a reversion of that, I fancy that. Who wouldn't want to go and see 15 minutes more of Spidey just doing his Spidey stuff. 60 years, 60 years since the first Spider-Man uh, in a comic. Are you a Zac Efron fan? Are you? Are you? Ask yourself, are you? I always think I am and then I think I'm not. And then I think I am and then I think I'm not. And uh, 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 He's done some turkeys and the terrible thing about Zac Efron is I can't really think of anything notable that he's done that I really really like. What's your favourite Zac Efron film? Was he in the movie version of Baywatch? I think he might have been. Anyway, Zac Efron, he's got more comedies coming out at Netflix. He's got more comedies than you could shake a stick at. Did he do The Neighbour? Good Neighbour? Bad Neighbour? Neighbours or something? With Seth Rogen? The Good Neighbour? Something like that. Anyway, he's coming to A24 have signed him up. That really kind of reputable powerhouse indie production company have signed him up for a project called The Iron Claw. The Claw is our master. Lots of Buzz Lightyear references here, aren't there? Uh, it's the latest drama from Sean Durkin. Sean Durkin is the director who gave us Martha Marcy May Marlene, which was the film that introduced us to Elizabeth Olsen. If you haven't seen it, you have to go and see it. That's your homework. That's your homework. Go and see it. He also made the recent film The Nest, starring Jude Law and Carrie Coons, who I have to say Carrie Coons was there. They, they were both really good in that. There's a review of it on the channel somewhere. I think I think I might have been a bit harsh on it, but it was very good. So Sean Durkin directing, Zac Efron starring, and this is the true story, The Iron Claw is the true story of the Von Erichs. Have you ever heard of the Von Erichs? Uh, the rise and fall of the Von Erich, Erich family, a dynasty of wrestlers who made a huge impact on the sport from the 1960s to the present day. Could be a bit nuanced, bit of character led. I, I want to see Zach give us character. Was he in? He was in the Greatest Showman. Was he in the Greatest Showman? I think he was in the Greatest Showman. Um, you just want to. You want layers. We want layers. We want dark. We want. We want edgy. We want raw. We want. We want jagged. We all that kind of stuff. That's what we want. Where have you been? If you missed this story, it was all over our popcorn junkies Instagram account. It's been all over the internet, absolutely everywhere. Lady Gaga is swirling around the Joker Two project. Uh, the Joker sequel that uh, Todd Phillips uh, trailed or teased on his Instagram last week. Uh, obviously, uh, Joker 2, uh, jo Joaquin Phoenix is uh, reading the script, is due to sign on the dotted line. No, no contracts have been signed yet, so they say. But anyway, the, the talk of the town is, is that Lady Gaga is looking to join the project as uh, this 
aspect of the DC Extended Universe, because this isn't part of the DCEU, so this is a sort of, this is like a chamber, a sort of a secret antechamber of the DC comic universe, where you can do things differently. And this is becoming the order of the day, isn't it, where you have many different iterations of the same characters, and people accept that you're indulging in this corner of Batman, or this corner of Flash, and all that kind of stuff. So the, the rumour is that Lady Gaga is going to play in uh, Todd Phillips's um, Joker, uh, that he, she's going to play Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn. You know, the psychiatrist that he, uh, that he kind of woos or becomes sort of embroiled with. I think she's the psychiatrist at the Arkham Asylum. Um, but the idea that she's going to be in it has led to these other rumours that perhaps Joker 2 is going to be a musical. Now, I've, I've done some digging into this to see how, where, where's the evidence that this is going to be a musical? Now, I can't find any other than there's a sort of thought that because Lady Gaga sings, could it be a musical? stretching it a bit because the house of gucci didn't become a musical did it she was the best thing in house of gucci i at first i was a bit mm, i'm not entirely convinced and then another part of me was like i've sort of tested it on people and people have gone oh this could be really good this could be really good dark jagged layered deep reservoirs of heartache break evil uh dysfunctionality that's what we're after isn't it dysfunctionality and i think lady gaga and joaquin phoenix as uh, harley quinn and uh, joker singing a song i don't know if i don't know if singing unless they go the sweeney todd the only thing i could grab at that could potentially work as a musical in, in joker terms is sweeney todd but then how would a musical in episode two in the sequel sit alongside episode one why would you mark such a sort of sharp difference how would how would that work how would that work Cleopatra, the movie, uh, a new movie version of Cleopatra starring Gal Gadot is swirling around Hollywood, various studios looking to grab at it, snap it up. The last time, obviously, there was a version of Cleopatra. It was back in 1963 when Joseph L. Mankiewicz uh, directed Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton in the infamous version, which won countless Oscars. I think it was about four Oscars or something like that. Anyway, Gal Gadot, who we know as Wonder Woman, obviously. She was also recently in Red Notice, Netflix's hit, uh, and uh, Murder on the Orient Express as well, was she too? Uh, she's soon to be seen in uh, Disney's uh, live-action version of Snow White as the evil queen. I think she'll be great. Well, she's playing Cleopatra. The story this week is really that Universal are looking to pick up this project. Um, it's going to be directed or made by the Falcon and the Winter Soldier's Carrie Scogland. Uh, I thought that was kind of... It was kind of directed in a very workman-like way. It was very sort of, you know, it was very pedestrian, I thought. So it doesn't excite me that Carrie Scogland is uh, directing this. But um, I think Gal Gadot looks the part. I, I'm curious to know whether Gal Gadot, being an Israeli Jewish uh, actress, playing essentially an Arabic Egyptian queen, whether that could be a cause for concern anywhere. I think if it was maybe the other way around, there might be a bit, a bit of concern. So I'd be curious to see if that causes any ruffling of feathers anywhere. And talking of Wonder Woman, obviously Gal Gadot being a, a fabulous iteration of Wonder Woman, though I can't say Wonder Woman really does it for me, who, who would have thought that there was a Wonder Man? I'm a big Marvel fan, I'm a big comic fan, but I never knew there was a Wonder Man. Marvel are developing a series based on Wonder Man. Wonder Man is one of Marvel's characters first came to us in 1964 uh, in the pages of uh, one of the Avengers comics. Uh, he was initially a villain, and then he would appear every now and then, coming back throughout the uh, Marvel ages, uh, and then was reconceived as a hero and an Avenger in the late 1970s. But what's intriguing about the Wonder Man character is that the Wonder Man character sort of uh, inveigles his way into and around Found WandaVision uh, and the whole kind of Scarlet Witch thing. Could there be a romantic tie in there? Um, there I think there is the suggestion that he uh, even develops feelings for Wanda after Vision uh, was dismantled at the end of WandaVision. So we could be looking, and there, there are rumour mills that they want to kind of resurrect some aspect of Elizabeth Olsen's um, WandaVision kind of series, which was I thought was the best thing yet on, on Disney+. Plus. Though I hear Miss Marvel is getting great, great reviews. I wonder though if Miss Marvel is a bit more of an infant series. Um, but uh, but yeah, so this could be interesting. Wonder Man could be their way back in to Wonder Vision uh, and a way to kind of reaccess the sort of weird and whacked out world of uh, Scarlet Witch. You'll have seen it. It's been everywhere, but I've, you can't do the weekly rushes without showing this. Ding! Is that Ryan Gosling with his washboard tummy? looking like, well, I think he looks a little bit like our friend Lisa's husband, Carl, with a, with a blonde wig on. Um, yeah, that's Ryan Gosling there as Ken. Uh, so, you know, things are moving on with the uh, with the uh, Margot Robbie playing Barbie, directed by Greta Gerwig and co-written by her and Noah Baumbach, uh, the new Barbie movie. Apparently, the suggestion is that there are numerous different versions of Barbie in the film. I don't know whether that's because there are numerous different dolls in a shop. Maybe they're all dolls in a shop and they're all played by different characters. I don't know. But it does look pink. It does look plastic. 
plastic, uh, and it certainly doesn't look like a sort of layered, nuanced, pastiche, New York-style indie comedy, does it? I mean, it doesn't look like that at all. He does not look like that, but it does show. It does show that Ryan Gosling has a sense of humour. Anyone see Aladdin? Anyone Did anyone like the live-action Aladdin? We, I, yeah, we quite enjoyed it, actually. We quite enjoyed it with, obviously, Will Smith. <sighs> Don't mention the slap. Will Smith, get back inside your, get back inside your, what are they? Lamp. Get back inside your lamp, Will. Um, Aladdin director, after the huge success of Aladdin hitting over the, hitting the billion dollar mark. It was a huge cracking success for Disney, uh, Aladdin, the live action. Guy Ritchie, the director, obviously Madonna's ex, uh, director of Lockstock and all that kind of stuff. The Sherlock Holmes films and all that malarkey. Um, it looks like he's being brought back into the Disney fold to do something similar with, I think, uh, a project that could work really well for him, actually. I think this will play to his strengths. He's remaking, he's doing a live action film version of Hercules. I think I'd rather see him direct um, the third Sherlock Holmes film with uh, Robbie Downey Jr. and allegedly with uh, Johnny Depp too. But hey, we'll settle for uh, we'll settle for Hercules. I think I think it could be up his street. I think that could work. A sort of lock stock. I wonder, I wonder if he'll get Jason Statham, Statham, Statham to uh, to play Hercules. Jerry Seinfeld. Yes, Jerry Seinfeld is making a film all about pop tarts. Our American followers will know what a pop tart is. Really tasty. Whenever whenever we're over in the states, we always think we'd like a pop tart, but we never really quite know how to eat them. Do you? Cut do you pour milk on them? Do you put stuff on them? Do you soak them? Do you cook them? Do you toast them? Pop tarts. I guess they pop because they pop out of the toaster, maybe. I don't know. Jerry Seinfeld, who's making a film all about the uh, the origin story of the pop tart. I mean, get, get origin stories the most bizarre things these days, don't you? Uh, has cast Hugh Grant to star in his stellar cast to join his stellar cast for his movie movie uh, Pop Tarts. The Paddington Two star Hugh Grant will be joining Melissa McCarthy, uh, Jim Gaffigan, Amy Schumer, and James Marsden for the project, which is for Netflix, which has got a, an, a working title of Unfrosted: The Pop Tart Story. I'm imagining this might be a little bit like the Michael Keaton story around McDonald's. And what have you. The logline or synopsis for this runs as Kellogg's and Post, the surnames of the two manufacturers, uh, sworn serial rivals race to create a pastry that will change the face of breakfast forever. A tale of ambition, betrayal, sugar, and menacing milkmen. Anything with that line, menacing milkmen, in it has got to be worthy of being watched. Don't you think? A menacing milkman. So I'm up for Jerry Seinfeld's Pop Tart film. Are you? Millie Bobby Brown. Millie Bobby Brown. Millie, 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 Millie Bobby Brown. As you know, we love Millie Bobby Brown. Um, I said many, many moons ago, and I said it to her, I said, you're going to be Princess Leia one day. That's not necessarily what's happening here. But the rumour mill is going very rumoury. It's ch chundering along. Well, there's that vomiting. It's charging along. It's, it's rumbling along. It's, it's ch choo chewing. It's doing something. Um, the rumour mill is talking about the prospect of Millie Bobby Brown joining the Star Wars family. Yeah, they're talking possibly a bumper payout of in the region of $12 million or £12 million for her to sign up, she's just 18, to sign up to either a new Star Wars film, which if that's the case, it would have to be something that's uh, with Taika Waititi because he's looking after the next feature film uh, in the Star Wars stable, or it could be a new Disney Plus series. I've always wondered whether she, she could play a brilliantly young, adulted Princess Leia. Uh, and obviously in the Obi-Wan series we're seeing at the moment, we've got a fantastically precocious and talented and ballsy young actress playing the, uh, she's not quite a toddler, but she's a bit older than that, but you know, the sort of infant Princess Leia. So I'm wondering whether Millie could actually be in line for that, or perhaps potentially could she be a brand new character, as I say, in the Taika Waititi film. But she has all the aspects about her, doesn't she? If she is, if she is going to, if they are going to create a completely new character, she could easily be this generation's Leia or, you know, Carrie Fisher type character. And obviously, Obviously, you know, with her track record on Stranger Things, she's a, an absolute sort of guarantee at the box office. She's a go-to of reliability and professionalism. Um, and she gets franchises. You know, you don't helm something like Stranger Things and, and stay, you know, you don't do any spoilers. You know how to keep it captivated for the audience and keep people teased and excited. I think she'll be an absolutely brilliant addition to the Star Wars family. I just hope I get a set invite. Lots of Game of Thrones fans throwing their hands in the air. Throwing their hands in the air, especially if they've been decapitated, they throw their hands in. How would you hold you? How would you throw decapitated hands in the air if you had, they're your hands? 
you'd have to sort of body hurl them into the sky, wouldn't you? Uh, Kit Harrington, they're talking about Kit Harrington um, possibly being on board for a Jon Snow Game of Thrones spin-off. Um, this is the Hollywood Reporter has been reporting that a sequel to the, uh, well, the original uh, Game of Thrones series, which ended on a bit of a fizzle. And given that me and Maddie watched them all back to back in recent years, we didn't watch them over time. We felt the fizzle. We felt the deflation. We felt the sort of rushed rambling rush to a conclusion that was sort of ineffective and and didn't merit the, the great complexity that had gone before. Um, but let's not go there. Uh, well, they're talking about Kit Harrington, who I, I've got a huge soft spot for. He's had all, he's fought all sorts of demons. He had a brilliant uh, run recently in the West End on the stage. Um, they're talking about him coming back uh, with a Jon Snow centered show, which could, as they say, as they're rumor, rumoring, uh, could open the doors potentially for a return of a lot of the other characters, his half siblings, Sansa and Arya Stark, uh, played by Sophie Turner and Maisie Williams, they could all potentially make a return, which in a sense essentially would mean, I think if this was to happen, what this would mean would be, would be that it's uh, Game of Thrones is back. No, isn't this just kind of Game of Thrones, but just in a, a different tunic? of some form. Uh, fans haven't been particularly happy. Some fans have been sceptical. These are some tweets that have been posted. Why would I trust them ever again? Season 8 was one of my worst television shows ever. It was so bad it took a top 5 show ever and made it unwatchable. Someone else said the only way this can work is if the first episode starts with him waking up from a nightmare before the last stand against the White Walkers on Winterfell. Uh, yeah, no, there is that. But uh, in addition to this Jon Snow sequel, uh, HBO Max are also looking at something like seven other possible spin-off shows. Seven. And if you think we've got Lord of the Rings coming, there's lots to get excited about, but I still have to catch up with just things like Obi-Wan. What, what am I dicking about at? Which brings us to Films of the Week. And Films of the Week, we have two Sundance darlings, actually. We have Cha-Cha Real Smooth. Cha-Cha Real Smooth is a an indie comedy uh, directed by Cooper Rafe, uh, but also starring Cooper Rafe, uh, in which he plays, uh, bizarrely, a sort of bar mitzvah host slash entertainer. Yeah, kind of kids entertainer, I guess, or kind of, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and he meets Dakota Johnson, who's an older woman with an autistic child. And it's about an unlikely romance, an unlikely partnering and pairing up. Uh, we watched the trailer, we reacted to the trailer. It's got that sort of feel-good, sundancey, schmucky thing about it, you know, indie all over it, stamp, stamp, stamp. He plays that kind of, you know, a bit, sort of a bit doopy, a bit gloopy, geeky kind of, you know, charm, sweet, but lovely. Uh, you know, maybe a bit obvious in its intent, this, uh, maybe a bit of an identity kit kind of indie film type thing, but it might be nice for a kind of rom-com comedy, if you fancy that. And Cha-Cha Real Smooth, sorry, yeah, Cha-Cha Real Smooth is on Apple TV. It's on Apple, not Netflix. The second film is Good Luck to You, Leo Grande, uh, or Leo Grand. Uh, we did a review of it, uh, me and Nadia. It's up here somewhere. It's somewhere else on the channel. Go and check it out. Um, it's a very sort of, uh, it's a chamber piece. It's a t two actors, uh, Emma Thompson and Daryl McCormack. She is a woman of 62, a widow, who decides that she would like to experience or check, tick off on her bucket list, some sexual experiences that she failed to have with her husband. Uh, she employs the services of Daryl McCormack, uh, who uh, plays Leo Grand, and and uh, they have several sessions together. And it becomes, it's a kind of sexual drama comedy. Uh, it, it, as we say in our review, it kind of, it tickles towards really interesting uh, d debates and topics and themes surrounding, you know, should women of a certain age be allowed to pursue pleasure? Uh, why do we have problems with women pursuing pleasure? Attitudes to body, body confidence. But there's also equally as much of an exploration around issues of sex work. Uh, and the role of this guy, this character played by Darren McCormack, uh, you know, where, you know, Know, when he's seeming so into her but he's actually performing it it's not real you know so ideas of what is love how can someone be made to feel cherished and what is being cherished uh, it's, a, it's a compelling and interesting film but do check out our review and that's good luck to you leo grand and for the family orientated viewer this week light year is the animated feature as i say it's the prequel the prequel to toy story uh, this essentially uh, takes us all the way back to the first toy story because it's all about the this is essentially about the film this or this is the film that buzz Lightyear came from that Andy in Toy Story was most excited about. Uh, it stars Chris Evans voicing Buzz, Taika Waititi's in there, James Brolin, Bill Hader. Uh, there's, a, you know, again, stellar cast. Um, you know, uh, Pixar tend to say we don't do sequels unless there's an absolutely compelling reason to do them, and I think that was uh, not the case with Cars 2. Uh, I also don't think it was the case with Finding Dory, was it, after Finding Nemo? I don't think that particularly worked well. Um, so this hasn't done as well at the box office already this weekend as uh, Pixar and Disney were hoping, but I still think, you know, the thing about Pixar and Disney is even when they do a dud, which isn't often, it's always head and shoulders above the rest. So if you fancy a bit of family escape, 
uh, light years your gig. And there you have the weekly rushes. This week's rush, rush through all the streaming and movie news that's hit the headlines this week. Tell us what you think, and I hope you have a fabulous film watching week. For more film and family fun, don't forget to click the subscribe button and make sure to click the bell to never miss an update.